For our project, we wanted to test the stability of different hull shapes and sizes. We decided to use the Viking Canar and the Viking Longboat as our models because they gave us consistency in both cultural background as well as ship construction, but they differed in hull shape and size. The Viking Canar was a long distance trading ship. It had a broad hull shape that made it fairly stable and therefore better able to handle the open ocean conditions it faced on its long voyages. The Viking Longboat was longer and narrower than the Canar, which allowed it to have a higher hull speed, but made it less suitable for open ocean travel. This potential speed of the longboat, as well as its inability to handle long voyages, suggests that it was primarily used as an attack ship. The Vikings built both boats in the clinker style, in which they built upward from the keel using overlapping wooden planks. In the early 1960s, five Viking ships were excavated from the Roskilde Fjord in Denmark. These boats were dubbed the Skaldelev ships after the town near which they were found. We decided to use Skaldelev 1 as the model for our Knarr and Skaldelev 2 as the model for our longboat. We used the measurements for each ship found on the Viking Ship Museum website and we replicated the shape of the hulls based on drawings found in Oli Krumlin Peterson's book on the Skaldelev ships. Skaldelev 1, the Knarr, has a length of 15.84 meters, a width of 4.5 meters, and a depth of 2.26 meters, and a mostly rounded hull. Skoldelev 2 had a length of 30 meters, width of 3.8 meters, and depth of 2.17 meters, and more of a V-shaped hull. The fish tank in which we were testing our boats had a width of 10 inches, a length of 20 inches, and a depth of 10 inches. We wanted to make our boats as big as possible within these constraints. Since we wanted our ships to have at least a 2 to 1 length to width ratio, the width of our canar was the limiting factor. We decided to make the cross section for each of our boats 16 inches in length. For the width and depth of the boats, we first scaled down the measurements from the museum website so that 1 meter equaled 1 inch, and then we multiplied those numbers by 1.75 to maximize our boat sizes. The final widths and heights for the boats were 7.8 inches wide and 4 inches deep for the canar, and 6.6 .6 inches wide and 3.8 inches deep for the longboat. After cutting out our hull shapes based on the drawings in Crumlin Peterson's book, we took long strips of balsa wood and constructed the boats in traditional clinker style by building from the keel up and overlapping the strips. We used hot glue to join the various pieces together and then sprayed the boats with rubber-based sealant in order to waterproof them. Our hypothesis was that the canar would be more stable than the longboat because its greater width and more rectangular hull shape would provide a stronger riding force than that of the longboat. To quantify this, we decided to measure the tilt of the boat caused by placing a weight incrementally further away from the center. This weight was meant to represent forces such as the wind and ocean waves that might cause a boat to roll to one side or the other. We ballasted the boats using bags of sand that weighed a total of 2,000 grams. We used the same amount of weight to ballast each boat. Even with this weight, they sat a little higher in the water than it is estimated the ancient ships would. We wanted the boats to be stable, but not so much that we couldn't get any rotation. We built a platform in the center of each boat that spanned the width and made marks every three quarters of an inch outward from the center of the boat on which we would place our weight. As we moved the weight, we tracked the observed angle of tilt relative to the weight's placement. We did this on both sides for each boat. We also measured the maximum angle that the boat could tilt before taking on water over one of the sides. This table shows the results of our trials with our Skull to Love 1 model. Our Skull to Love 2 model was much trickier to test. When placed in the water, the boat would not stay centered and would tilt about 5 degrees to either side. Thus, when we put the weight in the center, the angle was not 90 degrees. Additionally, the narrower hole meant that we had one fewer mark on each side to place the weight. This table shows the results of our trials with our Skoldelev 2 model. This graph shows the observed degree of tilt on the y-axis relative to the positioning of the weight on the x-axis. Skoldelev 1 is in red and Skoldelev 2 is in blue. Our Skoldelev 2 model had higher observed degrees of tilt relative to the weight's distance to center than our Skoldelev 1 model did. This graph shows the change in degree of tilt on the y-axis relative to the positioning of the weight on the x-axis. 
Once again, Skoda Love 1 is in red and Skoda Love 2 is in blue. Our Skoda Love 2 model had higher changes of tilt degree relative to the waist distance to center than our Skoda Love 1 model did. Based on our numerical data, as well as our general difficulty stabilizing our Skoda Love 2 model prior to testing, it would appear that our hypothesis is correct. The hull of the Canara, with its wider and more rectangular shape, is more stable than the narrower and more triangular longboat hull.